What's up, Catalyst? Happy Father's Day to everybody in the house today. Today, Father's Day, is uh, is a special day for me. I, 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 I will never forget. I'm gonna. I'm not. Okay. Somebody say, I'm not going to get emotional. Okay. I, I, that's not. Wait. I can't. I, I'll probably get emotional. I am an emotional person. I'm an emotional guy. I will cry. I'm not above crying. Okay. I, I am. I am enough that I. I will just. I will ball. Okay. I cry in movies. Um. I cry. It is okay to cry. Look. I am also very secure in who I am, okay, so I will wear pink, uh, I will, it, it doesn't bother me, <clears throat> I will wear shorts that are probably a little bit uncomfortably short for some people, yeah, thank you, uh, so I, I will, they, they're, they're there, so they are not, I am not bringing them, they are already there, but I am not, I am not against the trend, okay, uh, I I have been told today that I have a very quote dad fit on today. All right. Uh, so thank you, Uriah. Uriah is is my is my personal uh, fashion guru in my life. He is the reason that I wear fitteds as much as I do, um, and really the reason that I have the shoe collection. Honey, you can thank Uriah. Uh, Uriah is the reason that I have the shoes that I have. So uh, Father's Day is a special day for me. I will never forget uh, when my oldest son, Sam, was born, who is the only one that's not, not here with us today because he's down at Fort Moore uh, at basic training right now. So he is, has joined the Army, is, going, is really proud of him as a man, as a father. Uh, so he is the only one that's not with us today. Um, so, so thankful to have have Jordan, Uriah, and Paris, uh, the, the kids that made me a dad uh, in the house with us today. But I'll never forget that first time that Sam fell asleep in my arms as a baby. It's just something special to it. So, uh, you know, the men in here that are, that are dads, uh, that's something for me. That is the, that is the moment it became real. Uh, was it wasn't when Sam was born. Uh, I had no idea what was happening. Uh, I am not also not a blood guy, okay, unless it's fight blood. Uh, the only blood I like is fight blood. It's weird, I know, it doesn't bother me, but uh, some things do. And so I stayed north of the Mason Dixon line uh, as Sam was being born. All right, and it was still a lot, still almost passed out, still said to sit down. The other ones went a little better uh, than, than that one, but Carrie did all the work. She, I was just, I was just there to hang out, okay, so. Uh, but it was that, that's something that was just so important to me was, was being a dad when it became real was when I was holding Sam and, and he, he fell asleep and I just, it, it, it's something special to be trusted with a life. And, and before that point, you know, I, I, I didn't really understand what it was, but in that moment, everything just kind of came, became clear to me on what being a father was. And that is, I am trusted with a life uh, that I am there to protect. I'm there to provide. I'm there to be there for, for that child and to make sure that child makes it. And that's what I did uh, as the, the three oldest are, are now uh, grown and, and, and thankfully out of the house. Um, you know, they're doing their own things. And, and I'm so proud of the, the young men that they have become. Uh, Jordan as a police officer, Uriah in college to be a teacher and already working and then helping as a coach, and, and Sam, as I said, in the, the Army. So I'm so proud of the young men that they've, they've became, and, and really they, they have made me, uh, you know, I wasn't perfect as a father. I made a lot of mistakes, but when I look at where they are right now, I'm just, I'm thankful that God gave me the grace to see see them be be where they are in life and that means all means the world to me so there okay Whew. all right yeah there we go it's also I might as well get it out of the way might as well just go go rip the band-aid I'm a rip the band-aid off kind of guy 
Uh, also, this is the first Father's Day that I have had without my dad. My dad passed away late last year. And uh, if, if you're friends with me, um, last night, I, I, it really kind of hit me and got in my feels last night thinking about it uh, before I went to bed. And, and I, I just really felt led. So if you're friends with me on Facebook, I shared the eulogy that I gave at my dad's funeral. Um, and and it, it was important to me and special to me. Um, and, and I wanted to share it with, with, with anyone that's on my friends list. So if you're not friends with me, shoot me a friend request. I don't do Facebook a whole lot, uh, but shoot me a friend request. I will accept it sometime. I don't know, like uh, it may not be right now. So please don't get offended if it takes me a few days to circle back through and check all the boxes of, uh, of social media. Okay. So, uh, but shoot me a friend's request uh, and I'd be more than glad to accept it. Have you, have you as Facebook friends? Um, so, but I shared that and, and it's today is, it's, it's a special day, even, even for them. It's not a, for, for that reason. It's not even a sad day for me. Uh, you know, dad left me with, with a lot of positive things in my life and, and was showed me what it was really to be a man, uh, to, to be a dad. And, and he wasn't perfect either. And we didn't have a perfect relationship. So, uh, you know, the, the men in here today, as, as we kind of work through this, this message, uh, don't, don't hold yourself to that standard of having a perfect relationship with your kids. It's not going to be perfect, but you, you know, it's, it's important though, that you have that relationship with your kids. And this is day set aside to honor and to celebrate the fathers and father figures who have shaped our lives with their dedication, their love and their hard work. And fathers, your role is it's immense. Your responsibilities are, are great, but, you know, the impact that you have, it, it can't be measured either. We will teach our kids something. What we teach them is up to us. I'm saying you will teach your kids something. What you teach them is up to you. And it may be good. It may be bad. It may be uh it may be that, that you're not there. It may be that you're there too much. We've seen both ends of that spectrum, right? That you're there too much, you're too engaged, you're too involved, you're, too, you're, you're, you're taking things over. So you will teach them something. Your message titles are weird to me. Let me, let you, let me pe- let you peek behind the curtain just a little bit, okay? Message titles are weird. Some people title their messages very seriously when they preach. It's very direct. It's Romans chapter 8, life in the spirit. Others like to do the play on words and to, to, to have everything rhyme. Some, some, some preachers like to do, you know, they, they, they have layers to their, their message titles, and it'll be this leads to this leads to this. And, you know, it's as in the years of my ministry, I've, I've had a title and then prepared a message to go with it. I've in, had entire messages prepared and not had a title at all with it. So for this sermon and this, this service today, Tammy had asked me a few weeks ago if I knew what I was, what I was preaching about because she wanted to give a gift for Father's Day and, and as they said, we do have a, a, a gift for, for all the men today. But she wanted it to go with the message if possible. So I, I was like, huh, uh, what, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> I like a challenge. <laughs> what were you thinking? And she said, well, I'm, we've got this cool little, like, little multi-tool, just this little, you know, it's got, you know, different things. I said, perfect. Yep, let's do it. Almost by faith. <laughs> did I say it? Because in that at that moment, I really didn't know I was going to preach. <laughs> That's the other thing too. This this idea we're, we're just we're going we're pulling the curtain all the way back. Okay, this morning this idea that preachers always have everything laid out. I am not Ben. Okay, Ben has messages laid out for months. Okay, that's not me. He, he, ben can tell you what he's going to preach next spring. God speaks to him that way, and I'm so thankful for it. I'm just not there. Yeah, I, I can't hear that good. Apparently, God, 
It's just not me yet, right? It's just not me. So sometimes preachers, and, and we just don't have, we don't have it all together all the time, just like dads, right? We don't have it all together all the time. Some dads have different pieces together more than others. Ben and I are very yin and yang in a lot of ways in our ministry. You know, what he does really well, I don't. What I do well, is he, he, some of that he struggles in. Some of it we come together, we're both pretty good at. But that's why God puts people together. And, and in our lives, and as in different parts of our walk with God, God will put different people together in your life to compliment and to help and to encourage you. So as I was working and and then uh, I kind of, by faith, yeah, I can work with that, Tammy. (laughs) And I had had at that that point, I had a a notes page kind of full of a bunch of randomness. Uh, And that's really the way my brain works. I've gotten messages in the car. I've gotten messages everywhere. God has given me a message. God has, <laughs> God has given me a message. Boy, we're just doing it today. <laughs> From an outcast song once. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yep. Yeah. I didn't tell the congregation I preached that at that it was given to me with inspiration from Outcast, okay? They probably didn't even know who Outcast was. It wouldn't have mattered. They would have been like, oh, never heard of them before. Yeah, you guys do, right? Yeah. Miss Jackson, by the way, was the, the song. Okay, I'll just go ahead. And, okay, the song was Miss Jackson. The lyric is that you can plan a pretty picnic, but you can't control the weather, right? So that's the message. I preached the title from Outcast. You can plan a pretty picnic, but you can't control the weather. That was the message. It, it was really good, okay? It worked. It worked. God works in weird ways sometimes, even outcasts. So I told her, and, and God had given me, I had a bunch of just notes written. But then he gave me the message for today. So, so I, I, I want to preach to you today, title, Honey, Where's My Tools? Honey, where's my tools? It seems like that I say the words, honey, where's fill in the blank to carry as much as anything outside of I love you. Okay? Outside of just about anything other than I love you. I I tell her, I I am a big I love you guy too. Okay? My, when I talk to my family, And some of my friends, the phone call doesn't end unless I say I love you. It's important to me. I've started telling my 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 the the close men in my life that I love them. It's important to me that they know that. I have a group of friends that I that I, I hang out with regularly from all different walks of life, and I sent them a text this morning, and I told them, "Hey guys." I just want you to know I love you, and I appreciate you. I'm glad you're in my life, that you guys you guys make me better having you in my life. I, they will hold me accountable. They will tell me no if someone needs to tell me no. We have to have people like that in our lives, man. We have to have, we have, to have a no person in our life, and usually it's more than one no person, Right? Because we want to make sure that if if someone needs to tell me no, I want them to tell me no. I want them to care enough about me in my life and what I'm doing to tell me, Mark, you, you need to check that. Are you sure about this? And I need to respect those people enough that I listen to them and I hear them and that we have a conversation about it. So I'm thankful for those people that I have in my life. So I'm a big I love you person. So outside of I love you, I say, honey, where's anything that I own? For us, it might have something to do 
with me having a wife that has to clean and has to put everything away, even if it's not exactly where I think it should go when she puts it away. Even if it's not where it was before, even if it's not where she put it the last time, it will be put away. It will look, it will be, it will be away. Be away. Honey, where's my fill in the blank? (laughs) But today, the question goes beyond, and I want us to think beyond just the simple act of finding a misplaced hammer or screwdriver. I want us to take a deeper look and look for some deeper truth about the readiness to do the work that's in front of us. And men to acknowledge that sometimes we need the help and the support of people around us and people that we love. There is a work to be done. When when I ask, honey, where's have you seen have you seen the cordless drill lately? And have you seen have you where's the Phillips head screwdriver at care? Honey, do you know where the the hammer is? She knows in her mind. She's like, oh, Mark's going to fix whatever it is that she's probably been asking me a little bit too long to fix. But she knows I'm getting ready to put some work in. Get ready to do something. I'm getting ready to, to take care of something. Honey, where's my tool? So I want to look today at the story of Nehemiah, a man who saw the need for rebuilding something who understood the power of a collective effort and divine guidance. Our scripture today in Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse number 17 through 20. It says, Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lieth in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Nehemiah said, Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. There is such a negative connotation in today's society around men that it really bothers me. And I know that's, I, I know that it's it's hard to talk about. Because just like everything, there are good and bad in everything. There are good and bad men, there are good and bad husbands, there are good and bad wives, there are good and bad women, there are good and bad everything. But it seems like that there is a highlight on men being bad in today's society. So in this message today, and I know this may not feel like a typical Happy Father's Day, you know, woohoo! hey, we're going to go barbecue, let's click, clink some tongs, ding, 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 let's go flip some burgers, let's put some hot dogs on the grill. And I know there, there, there as men, you know, we, we pushed and, and asked for you to come, and if you're watching, we, we, someone invited you or shared, or you saw this somewhere on your feed. And you might not have thought that, hey, that, that this might just be a check-a-box kind of service. It's Father's Day, but I want to challenge us today. We're not a -a check-a-box church. I don't think God wants a -a check-a-box bride. I don't think he wants check-a-box people. I think everything about the Bible, if you let it, will challenge you to step outside of your box that you're in. And to be very introspective about what God wants for you and where he wants to take you. And I'm not being political today. I'm not, I'm not doing anything other than challenging the men and the fathers in this room. That if you look at what the world says right now about us, it's that we're not there. It's that we're too much. It's that we're just... We're, we're surface, uh, surface men, and it's just it's just this hard outer shell, and nothing else matters. That 
section in this verse today strikes me in my heart when I think about men, that we be no more a reproach, that we take away the negative. And I want to challenge you today to walk your life so that when people look at you as a man, when they look at you as a father, when they look at you as a mentor, when they look at you as somebody in someone's life, that you take the reproach away from what it is to be who you are. You don't have to be ashamed of who you are. Wherever you're at in your life, whoever you are today in this room, God wants to make you better. God wants to change you. If you're not changing what's our core value, you're not growing. You want to be something better. But you don't have to be what everyone says that you are. You don't have to fall into the mold of the world and what everyone thinks the bad that is with you. I don't have to just be another middle-aged white guy. I get that there are a lot of stereotypes around a middle-aged white guy. If you know me very well at all, that is not me. (laughs) It should be me. It should be me. I grew up in West Virginia. Diversity wasn't a thing. We were all poor. We didn't know no difference. And that's what I grew up with. We were all poor. And I'm thankful for a dad that taught me core values to treat everybody the same, regardless of where they are, who they are, what they look like, where they come from, where they are in their life. I don't have to agree with where you are in your life to love you. I don't have to agree with where you are and the decisions you've made. Because, you know, if we look at Scripture and we look at, we look at the, the life that Jesus led on when he was walking on this earth, do you think he agreed with everybody? No. Quite the contrary. He was the perfect one. We were all the messed up ones. If, you, if, you really, if Jesus really wanted to take that mindset that is, that is so ingrained in, in the world today that, that if you don't look like me, act like me, talk like me, say the same things as me, you're bad. Jesus thought everybody was bad. He would have thought everybody was done. He would have walked down here and said, oh, I'm going back. (laughs) I'm out. It's not worth it. But he was willing to outside of what was accepted by society to reach his hand out and pull people up. And then he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice and stretch his hands out and let nails be driven through his hands. Let his side be pierced and die for the sins of all mankind so that we didn't have to live a slave to the oppression of sin and the chains and bondage of bad decisions and bad mistakes. So we didn't have to be a reproach anymore. The rest of that verse goes on. He says, then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. And also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. For this powerful story today, I want to pull out some key lessons and inspiration for us to look at in our own lives. The roles that we play in our families and in our communities. I want us to figure out how to recognize those needs around us. To gather the right tools. To work together. And to overcome any obstacle in our way. All with God's guidance and the love and the support of our family. First thing Nehemiah had to do is he had to recognize the need. 
Nehemiah saw the ruins of Jerusalem and knew that something had to be done. He knew that there that, that it shouldn't be this way. So if we're honest with 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 ourselves today, there's aspects of our life. And fathers, just like Nehemiah, I want you to take an honest look and for you to see the need in your families and in your homes. You see the broken gates like Nehemiah did. You see the walls that need repair. But listen, this isn't an accusation that you're doing something wrong today. Sometimes things just break. Sometimes things just fall apart. If you have an old house, you know that everything just don't work the same way all the time. Right? And sometimes you might not know where to start or what tools you need. But you know something needs to be done. Men, it's time to start looking for our tools. Nehemiah didn't try to rebuild the wall on his own. I want every man, every father in this place to know today. Every acting father, every mentor, every person that is something to somebody. I want you to know in this house today that you are not alone. You are not by yourself. And you don't have to do all the work on your own. Nehemiah. Nehemiah didn't try to rebuild it on his own. He sought for the support and the help of those around him. He sought support for people that had more power than him. He sought support for people that had less authority than he did. He sought, thought, thought, he, he looked for support from everybody in his life. Because he knew that he couldn't do it by himself. Let's be real. Sometimes... Fathers, we don't like asking for help. We like to we like to think we just I can fix it. Sometimes it's been a while since we fixed something. Sometimes it's been a while to since we since we figured something out. And it's okay to to need a hand. Your wives and your children, your church, your men's group they're there to support you. Find people close to you, friends that are there. You don't have to carry the weight alone. Somebody say, honey, where's my tools? <laughs> Pulling the right tools together. How many have ever tried to do a job with the, the wrong tools? Every man, every man that's ever done anything. I like to change my own brakes, okay? I do. I, I enjoy that. Used to enjoy that. And it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder. And there's a trick that my dad showed me a long time ago. Uh, with a, using a seat clamp to push the pistons in, right, so that you didn't have to re-bleed your brakes, and you just have to spend time pumping and pumping and pumping and holding and pumping and holding and filling and pumping and all that stuff. And I remember one time trying to do my brakes with a seat clamp that wasn't quite big enough, and I busted so many knuckles. I think I ran out of knuckles. Trying to get the piston back depressed enough to get those brand new brake pads across the, over about that rotor. It's hard sometimes. Sometimes you don't have the right tools. So I want to take us through some things today. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 18, we see that Nehemiah shared his vision and encouraged the people by telling them about God's favor and everything they'd done. Fathers, Gathering the right tools isn't just about physical tools. I've gotten to where now that, that I will, Google is my best friend. 
and I will Google what tools I need before I start. I'm learning. I'm adapting. It's dangerous. It's dangerous that I that I'm I'm getting there, so that I put everything together. Because I remember changing, trying to change something on Sam's car. He had a Volkswagen, uh, and I remember trying to do something. And I think I went to O'Reilly's and advanced eight times before I got it done. <laughs> because I didn't have nothing that I needed. And then every time I thought I had everything I needed and got back and did one step, then I needed something else that I didn't have. So I want to talk to us today about some spiritual tools, men, that we need to tackle the job and the things that are in front of us. Spiritual tools like faith and prayer, wisdom and love. And look, before we talk about those tools, though, I just want to take a second just to mention Nehemiah's leadership for a second. His desire and ability to step up when he saw something needed done was willing to motivate and to lead people to tackle the work that was before them. Nehemiah wasn't afraid of what was there. He knew it was bigger than him. But he did decide that he wasn't going to do it on his own. I'm so proud told Carrie this morning, who's standing in our 1015, I'm so proud of Bradley. And I want, the reason that I'm proud of Bradley, Bradford will work his tail off. Bradford said something in the 1015 that just made me see how much growth he's had. He's talking about the work that, that we have and the upper room and what we're doing and all the things. And Bradford said, I can't do it all on my own. I remember Bradford when that would have been the only option for him. He wouldn't have asked for help. You just found him doing it. And he's realized that doing it on his own is hard. He's taking baby steps. He's still Bradford. Right? He's still Bradford. But that's growth. And men, that's something that, that we all need today. To realize that we don't have to do it all on our own. That's leadership. We don't have to do everything. We can gather these tools together and we can start handing them and asking other people to help and to pitch in. So those spiritual tools I talked about, faith, to trust in God's plan for your family. Nehemiah had faith that God would guide them through the rebuilding process. He had faith to take a step out when it was a mess. I want to encourage somebody that you right now are sitting here in your mind are thinking that your life is a mess. Take that step of faith. Proverbs 3 and verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. You don't have to know how it's all going to work out. Just know and trust that if I put my trust in God, that God's going to lead me through it. Give the Lord that hand clap of praise. That's another thing we do. We tell you to do something so we don't have to talk for a second so we can get a drink of water. You guys have new understanding. We're going full Wizard of Oz today, pulling back the curtain. Some of you don't know what that is. It's okay. Watch the old movie. You'll understand. The Bible says, finishes up there in Proverbs chapter 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The next tool is prayer. To seek God's guidance in your decisions and actions. Just as Nehemiah prayed before taking action, fathers, we have to pray for strength and for wisdom. 
Philippians 2, or Philippians 4, excuse me, verses 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Prayer is what will plug you in to him. And he is who can fix everything around you. It is just that connection, that growth, that relationship that you have to have. And you have to be willing to listen to the voice that comes back to you when you pray. I talked about having a no person in your life. God needs to be on that list. That you can pray, and it's not just God I want, God I want, God do this, God do this, God do this. What kind of relationship would it be if that's what the way you treated your wife, and it's all it was, is that I want you to do this, and you better do this, and you better do that. So let's not treat God that way. Let's let it be a relationship, a conversation, so that when we ask him for something, if God closes the door for us, that we say, okay, Lord, I hear you. I'm not going to kick that door down. I'm not going to keep knocking on that same door. I'm going to walk away and look for something else to open. Because that's the way God works. The next tool is wisdom. Some people think that wisdom means having all the answers. That you just have this Rolodex. Well, it's all, okay. There's a term that you probably nobody under... 35 knows what it is. Okay. No judgment. All right. I want you to raise your hand if you don't know what a Rolodex is. Okay. Yeah. Dry, you know what a Rolodex is? Okay. Whew. Y'all know what a Rolodex is. Okay. <laughs> okay. A Rolodex is something they used to keep before you had cell phones and a contacts list. It was something you would flip that had all names and, and phone numbers. There was no email then, so it didn't have email in there. It was not Maybe it had a fax number in there that, that if you needed something, you could flip it. And it was an alphabetical order, and you flipped to find who you were looking for. That's how you, other than memorizing phone numbers, which we did back in the day too, okay? We had to have phone numbers memorized before mom would let us go certain places. You had to have your phone number memorized when you were little kids. Now it's, wait, I, let me look at my phone. Sometimes I don't know my own phone number. Yeah, pagers, let's not even talk there. That's a, but used to be there was no cell phones, and before there were cell phones, or when, when only the, the, the people that were wealthy had cell phones, um, you, had, you, you got lucky. If you were lucky and you had pagers, mine was clear blue, and I thought I was cool, okay, when I was in high school. I had a clear blue pager. I clip it right there on my belt. Just like a lot of dads my age has that OtterBox case. I'm not uh, judging nobody, but that's if that before the OtterBox and the phone case, it was a pager. Okay, it's just what we did. It's what we did. It wasn't. And then it, if you got a page, there was a whole there was a whole thing about you know different codes that you would text and your friends would put on the pager so you knew what it was. 911, man, call me back really quick. There's an emergency. I need you. And it may not be an emergency. It just may have been an emergency to them because we were just as dramatic then as what you guys are now. It was just different. Then we had to go look for a phone. Pay phones. That's not a thing anymore either. Phone booth, rotary phones, all those things. Corded phones. Uh, I walked out. I was in I was in someone's house the other day and I walked in their bathroom and there was there's this weird thing. Some of you might not even know what it was. Weird thing on the wall is a phone jack. Y'all didn't know nothing about it. We don't have phones in our house no more. Phone jack in the bathroom, in case you know you had to get on the phone and use the bathroom at the same time. No idea. Some contractor thought that was a really good thing forty years ago. Probably was. That's right. So we don't have to have all the answers in this magic answer box, okay? <laughs> but really, wisdom is just being open to advice and guidance. 
from somebody around you. Let me tell you, your spouse and your household and the people that you trust, and most of all, God, he has the answers. And they can help you find the answers. Wisdom is just being open to that. Nehemiah listened to the concerns and the ideas of the people around him. James chapter 1, verse number 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally. Oh, Lord, that's a tough one there. Sometimes he give it, we don't use it. When, when the Bible says, oh, y'all listen, it's taking away some excuses today. I'm sorry. Don't shoot the messenger. The Bible says that if you ask him, he'll give it to all men liberally. Okay, you don't have an excuse no more to not know. God, God will give you the answer. You just have to ask him for it. The answer is there for you. The hard questions, the hard things that we don't know how to handle, it's there. He said, and it shall be given to him. The last tool that I mentioned was love. Lead with love and compassion. Your family looks to you for strength, but they also look to you for love and understanding. They look to you not just for correction, but for an arm to reach around them when they know they messed up. They know they screwed up. They know they shouldn't have done it. And to come to you, and they may be even expecting correction, but what they need is love. Men, use the tool of love in your life. Somebody say, honey, where's my tool? Working together. Nehemiah didn't build the wall alone. I mentioned it earlier. But he motivated people. He organized them. And they worked together. Fathers, your role is critical. But you don't have to do it alone. <clears throat> Involve your family in the process. I know it's hard, but let your kid hold the tool. More than just a flashlight. They ain't going to do it right anyway. Let them hold the tool. Let your wife offer her insights. <laughs> Mine's smarter than I am. Find out what working together really looks like. What a collaborative effort is. And when you start doing that, you'll realize that together that you can really achieve great things. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to lift him up. Men, let somebody help you out. Be, be transparent. Be open enough to reach your hand up and ask for help. Don't be the, I got this. I get up on my own. I'm grown. Just making it harder on yourself. Two are better than one. I don't know how many times my wife has been there to pick me up. My kids, as they've gotten older, even when they were young sometimes, they were the ones that spoke those words of encouragement to me. And roles flipped and reversed. Things don't always have to be one way. You don't have to always be in control. Let them speak into your life. Let them tell you something. Let them help you. Let them guide you. Because there's a job to be done. There's a family to be raised. There's a community to be helped. There's someone that doesn't have a father that needs one. There's mentees that need mentors. 
there's somebody that's struggling and just doesn't know how to climb out of the depths that they're in that needs somebody to be there for them. And we can't do it on our own. We've got to work together. Overcoming obstacles. Nehemiah 4 and 14, we see that they faced opposition. But Nehemiah encouraged the people. He said, be not ye afraid of them. I want to tell someone today, a man that's looking at obstacles in his life, that in his heart, even though he would never show it, in his heart, he is afraid of what he's facing. I want you to hear Nehemiah today. Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord. I want you right now, and as you move forward in in this week, this month, this year, your life, to remember the Lord, which Nehemiah said, which is great and terrible, and fight men. He's talking to, he's, Nehemiah's talking to them. He's, he's preaching to the congregation right here. Fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Fathers, there's going to be challenges in our life. There's going to be times when the work seems too hard. There's going to be times when the tools seem inadequate. But remember, you are not alone. God is with you, and your family is beside you. Joshua chapter number 1, verse number 9 says, Have I not commanded thee? See, this is what I love about the Bible. It's real. I said about challenging earlier, how if you let it, the Scripture will challenge you. If you if you read it, now if you gloss over it and pick out, you know, if you take all the... Uh, all the marshmallows out of your cereal, and that's all you eat? That's all you're going to get? But you're missing some nutrition when you do that. Joshua 1 and 9 says, Have not I commanded thee? Sounds like he's getting on to us a little bit, doesn't it? Makes me feel some kind of way. Man, that should be a phrase we're familiar with. Haven't I told you? How many times have I told you? We should be familiar with this. We don't like it when it comes back to us, though. Haven't I told you? Joshua, his his, those words, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee. Whithersoever thou goest. Carrie, if you want to come on to the piano for closing. God is with us wherever we go. Fathers, today, I want to challenge you to look at the walls in your life that need rebuilding. Take a good look around in your heart things in your life that are not what it needs to be. It's not what it should be. It's not what it used to be. And I'm not telling you that because you, you've done anything wrong today. I'm telling you that because there's a job to be done. Maybe it's a relationship with your child. It's not what it should be. Be the man. Be the father. Go to them. Love them. Pour out those spiritual tools that we talked about. Maybe it's spending more quality time with your family. Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's turning down a promotion. I've turned down a few. Especially several years ago had an opportunity to take a much larger position in my company. And I turned it down because 
I didn't want to miss a kid's ball game. I liked being eight miles away from the house. I liked being able to take them to the doctor's office if I needed to. I wanted to be there, and I was. Sometimes I was too loud. But I was there, and I worked on it. Maybe it's being more present and engaged when you are there. Don't be afraid to ask, honey, where's my tool? To embrace the support of your loved ones and the guidance of God. 